Hey everybody, thanks for joining with me this evening, Friendship Blessing Church's Wednesday evening, 7 p.m. Bible study. You probably know that if you're joining in, so I know it's redundant every week. It gives me kind of a beginning place. And also then it kind of, in case somebody new joins in or whatever, they know what they're joining in on. But uh, today is August 11th, 2021. And so we are at the end of a 12-week Bible study. If you've been following along, it actually took us um, 13 weeks, I think, because we we missed a week. So uh, we're finishing up this week our study in 2 Corinthians. Let me bring that up for you. Um, in 2 Corinthians... Now, hopefully you're aware. If not, you're new with us this evening. It's That's good because this is the last of, of a 12-week study, and then we're going to start a new 13-week study next week. We're moving on, moving back to the Old Testament. We're going to begin a Bible study in Genesis. We're going back to the beginning. In the beginning, God. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Um, and so, you you know, I mention this a lot, but I'm going to do it again um, this evening. You can check out all of our material. Let's see if I can get the right screen here for you. You can check out all of our material on, the, on our website, friendshipwesleyan.org. You'll see here, friendshipwesleyan.com does it as well. Um, but I wanted to do, I think a week or two ago, I showed you this, so where you can check out our Bible study material. So if you go to our website, go to About FWC, go down to Ministries, go over to Wednesday Night Bible Study. Real easy to get to. Then you'll see here Genesis Reading Plan. Second Corinthians is still on there. I brought up the PDF, just two different types. You'll see the Genesis reading plan goes through November 10th. Hopefully, um, uh, hopefully, unlike last time, or we'll make it different than last time where we missed a week, we had to expand it out. But if we have to, we will. So August 18th, next week, we're going to start our Bible study in, uh, in Genesis. So let me, I also want to, I wanted to show you... Um, Actually, let's let's I'll do it next week for you. I'm going to um, next week. I'll take you to, back to this same page. Hopefully I'll remember. And um, I'll show you how to get to our Bible study material, three steps of Bible study. And next week we'll go over that really, really quick um, so that uh, you, you, especially if you're starting over or new with us, you'll have an idea of how. I study the Bible for our Bible studies and how you can study right along if you so de desire. So grab your Bibles and uh, open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Yay, the last chapter. Um, let me open us. Let, let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Father, um, we're, we're hungry for your word every single day. Father, we're grateful to have the Bible, to have the message of hope that you meant for us. The, and we know, Father, that your word is a message to us, a message of love, message of hope. Um, Father, we thank you for the complete transparency and, and truth of your word as we read it. Father, there's a lot of tough stories in there about our humanity and about our brokenness. And you're reaching down into that and bringing judgment. Um, Father, There's, uh, we don't often like to talk about that, but you are a righteous judge. And we're grateful because it comes out of your love. Um, uh, all, Father, all, we know all of who you are. Your total character comes out of your love. And so, uh, Father, we're grateful that you are love. Guide and lead us in your word tonight. We're in the last chapter, 2 Corinthians, Lord. We thank you for Paul's incredible experiences. None of us would want to go through them. But he remained faithful. And today, Father, we're, we're mindful that we have 
uh, such important parts of your word to guide and lead us and to teach us more about Jesus. So do that tonight through your spirit. Teach us. We pray it in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. So I think I already gave it up, right? That we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 14. So open your Bibles up to that. Just a couple of uh, reminders here. Um, and I'm not going to go into full detail, but um, uh, remember in both 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Paul does some defending of his ministry from accusations that were taking place um, in the church. These last three chapters of 2 Corinthians are known to be very harsh, I'll use as severe, some people say. Um, and I've also mentioned that they're, they're so severe, so harsh, that there are a number of scholars who actually think this was probably a separate letter added on to the end. Most don't agree with that, that, that Paul just, um, this was Paul's conclusion to the, that letter um, to the church in Corinth. Um, and he was being upfront and direct to them, defending his apostleship and also speaking into um, th uh, their need to return to the pure gospel, not be led astray by super apostles. Um, hopefully you remember that word. So it, it's interesting to me as, we, as I uh, did this study on uh, chapter 13, final chapter. If you know anything about Paul's writings, his letters, you, you'll know that he he finishes them up in, in it, it's fairly typical for him to finish up with, I call them administrative issues. Um, remember this, do this, do that, you know, wait for my, you know, whatever. Um, he finishes a lot of them with final greetings. Um, very nice conclusions to uh, uh, to his letters. Personal greetings. He gives personal greetings. He mentioned names, a lot of people that he's grateful for. Um, he gives final instructions. Uh, First Thessalonians, you go to the end, you'll see he gives final instructions. Ephesians, he says to put on the full armor of God. Um, I thought of Philippians where close to the end. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Then we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul's, Paul's conclu conclusion to this letter, I found it interesting. Let's go back to our PowerPoint here. And if you, if you have where there are, um, topical headings or um, titles to certain sections within chapters, um, then some of your Bibles will read this way, final warnings. Now you'll notice that Paul does give final greetings down beginning of verse 11, but it, if you're looking at that, you'll see it is very short and sweet. Most of Paul's um, conclusion here is uh, is this final warning. Now, I'm not saying that like like I'm totally on board with this. Paul was just being harsh. Matter of fact, if you read these final greetings, um, I would say this: his harshness is coming out of his love for the Corinthian church and for the people there, not out of some need to be critical and harsh with them. So let's back up to verse 1, chapter 13, and let's get started on some of the text here. I think we're going to get to most of it tonight. A lot of nights we don't get to every verse, but we're going to at least get through, I think, at least reading most of the verses here. So uh, chapter 13, verse 1, this will be my third visit to you, Paul says. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. And just take note there, if you have a reference Bible, you'll probably see an endnote or a footnote letter reference there. And if you go to that, you'll see that it's an Old Testament reference from Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. So he's quoting uh, Old Testament 
law. So two times Paul has said that he's making his uh, third visit um, over in verse 14 of chapter 12. If you take a look at that, he says, now I'm ready to visit you for the third time. And then in, in 13.1, this will be my third visit to you. So just a reminder here, Paul's first visit, we find in Acts chapter 18. You can go there. I said, it's what's so cool about the Bible and confirming itself. You can go to Acts chapter 18 and you'll find the whole story of how the church was initially planted in Corinth by the Apostle Paul. And then in our studies, we're not going to go into it very far this evening, Paul made a second visit in between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, most believe, most scholars believe. And then we know from references, mainly in 2 Corinthians, that Paul, uh, that that second visit, I should say, we're still on the second visit, was a painful visit. I'm doing the quotes because that's what the text says. A harsh visit, a painful visit. Um, and so um, they had accused him in, uh, if you remember, in uh, uh, chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians of being fickle because um, he had promised two visits and he only makes one. You can check all that out in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse uh, 2. So so, so we're, we got two visits. They criticize him because he promised. Actually, it would have been three according to his. And I say promise. I don't mean Paul. I don't mean Paul said, I promise you. I mean, simply had stated that he would like to have made two visits after that initial visit. And he only made one. And so they were accusing him of being fickle. Now we're looking at a third visit. So um, Paul, and of course we don't have it by the end of 2 Corinthians um, uh, chapter 13, but uh, Paul's referring to a, uh, a third visit that, that he did actually get to make. Um, I won't go into details on that, but if you do some of your deeper digging, you'll find it's widely agreed upon that Paul did make a a uh, third visit there and give them some final instruction. And actually some great stuff happened in, um, we believe, um, and actually we have some proof and evidence I'm going to get to in just a moment. But um, uh, Paul, uh, the church did improve and even some of this final group he's referred to in the second Corinthians letter appear to have mostly um, change their ways and, and come around to the message that, that Paul had presented to him. But I wanted to also, in, uh, in verse 1, um, this will be my uh, third visit to you. Um, I, I, in verse 10, I think verse 1 and verse 10 are, uh, are connected. And, and, and I'm just remembering here that, that some of them had accused him. Remember they accused him of being mean? in uh in his letters but a pushover when he was in person they he addressed that and uh and those are my words but i that's what it seems like they were saying he re reiterates in verse 10 so verse 1 he said i'm making a third visit and then in verse 10 this is why i write these look at verse 10 this is why i write these things when i am absent that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not tearing you down. So he's going back to that whole issue. He said, <clears throat> which we explained, I, you know, when we went over that before we, uh, I was sharing with you that, that um, Paul was saying he didn't have to be harsh in person when they responded to the harsh letters. We know he did have a harsh visit, so he was willing. It's just an accusation they were making. So in verse 10, he comes back to that and responds. So I'm hoping on this third visit, I don't have to be harsh. So listen to what's being said here in the, uh, in the, in the letter. <clears throat> and it sounds like the church, once again, responded well. And his third visit wasn't uh, what we, we I believe it wasn't that harsh of a visit. Now very little is heard of the Corinthian church after Paul's letter of 2 Corinthians. 
uh, some 35, 40 years, I believe, in between that and 95 AD, when we have a writing from one of the early church fathers. We depend a lot on um, uh, writings outside the Bible. There's incredible history and stuff outside the Bible that confirms um, the, the validity of, of the Bible, the history of the Bible. And there's this real interesting um, text. I say text, it's, it's rather large, but um, in 95 AD, a, a guy by the name of Clement, um, also known as Clement of Rome, a er, an early church father, um, and and maybe the Clement. You got to look at this. If you look at uh, Philippians, let's go there real quick. Philippians chapter four. See if I can find it here. Chapter four, verse three. Many believe it's this Clement. Listen to this. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have continued at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. So this Clement, uh, one of the church fathers who kept a record of things going on, may have been the same one in the text that knew Paul uh, personally. So he writes a letter to the church in Corinth, and we have it. Writes a letter to the church in Corinth. By the way, 65 chapters long, so it's, it's not a short read. And I got to tell you, while from Paul's final visit to 95 AD, it really looks like the Corinthian church had done well, we have a piece of history that says they returned to some old ways. This stuff is just so interesting to me. I actually have this on our, um, let's see if I can find it here, in our PowerPoint. I took quotes from this writing, this letter to the church in Corinth. You can find it as well um, if, if you search um, letter of Clement, Clement of Rome to the church in Corinth, you'll find it. But he begins kind of in Pauline fashion by being positive, and in this case, what they had been. So let me read it for you. This is Clement to the church in Corinth. You were sincere and uncorrupted and forgetful of injuries between one another. Every kind of faction and schism was abominable in your sight. You mourned over the transgressions of your neighbors, their deficiencies you deemed your own. You never grudged any act of kindness being ready to do every good work. Chapter two, actually, that's right in the beginning. Um, it, 65 chapters, it's not going to take Clement very long because in chapter three, now, if you went and read this, you'll see there's a lot more that he actually says about the positive things they had been doing. Now in chapter three, I don't believe this is the beginning of the chapter, so there's more before this and more after this, a lot afterwards. He says this, for this reason, righteousness and peace are now far departed from you, inasmuch as everyone abandons the fear of God and has become blind in his faith, neither walks in the ordinances of his appointment, nor acts a part, becoming, uh, nor acts a part becoming a Christian, but walks after his own wicked lust, resuming the practice of an unrighteous and ungodly envy by which death itself entered into the world. So Clement gets pretty, I mean, this is almost even a little bit more than Paul's severe letters to the church in Corinth. So maybe you're wondering if you know how we study. So what's the application here, right? What's what in knowing a history like this, a very positive piece, which the church did very, very well for a number of decades, and then we have historical proof that they've returned to some old habits. Um, here's what I think the application is. We all very tempted to return to old habits. I've seen, I've seen this so many times. A matter of fact, it's one of the big dangers when we come to faith in Jesus and we place our faith in him. One of the potentials is, is that in coming tough days, discouragements, whatever else, we, we become tempted to return to old things. 
and, and obviously this church was, which I found a little ironic because um, it reminded me that the Apostle Paul had warned them of this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. He says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. So application for you and me, for us, we're human beings just like those in Corinth. And then this historical story out of Corinth that in, uh, in a number of decades to come, they would return to some of the very similar things that Paul had tried to teach them otherwise. So just a note here, I read to you, every matter must be established, verse one, by the testimony or two or three. I kind of gave you a heads up already. If you have a study Bible, that, that's a quote from 1915. We're not exactly sure what Paul's getting at here, but probably one of two things. We know he was getting at the Old Testament law. He may have, he just mentioned his third visit, so he might he might have been saying, Old, Tis, Old Testament law requires two to three, um, uh, two, uh, two to three to establish a matter, to judge on something. And I've been there. This will be my third time. So I get to act as judge. I'm going to get to. Or he may have been referring to um, leaders along with him or in the church. Um, either way, the point, the point seem, cl seems clear that Paul was saying, I am making a right judgment in what I write to you according to Old Testament law. So he's simply saying, I'm following the scriptures here in the judgment that I'm making. Now let's jump to verse two. I already gave you a warning when I was with you the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others. Since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. He who? Jesus, right? Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, we will live with him in our dealing with you. So there's a lot to be gotten there. I think some of it's just coming out of the verses we've already studied. But the thing that caught my attention was uh, in that uh, verse, uh, verse uh, three, let's see here. Um, verse four, sorry about that. For to be sure he was crucified. And it's obvious from verse three that he's speaking of Christ. So, and I just wanted this whole thing of Paul's comparison of weakness to strength and these super apostles that we've studied over the last couple of weeks. He's saying here, and think about it for a moment, right? Just the fact that Jesus became flesh like us was in a certain way a weakness, right? He lowered himself, Philippians said, he let your attitude be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who lowered himself and took on the form of a servant. He didn't consider equality with God something to be grasped. Or in uh, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. To become flesh, human being, was a weakness. He could have come in divine righteousness and judgment, power of God. But he came in weakness and gave himself over uh, to death, right? And then I thought to myself, he came as a baby. Can't get much weaker than that, right? Paul, in last week's study, 12, 9, chapter 12, verse 9, he said, God's power is made perfect in weakness. He died on the cross. He died a physical death, which showed the weakness of the flesh, but it was out of that dead. And then Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And now we have the power of God through weakness. So you and I are weak and we've got to let God work into that weakness. Um, through through his power. Now, um, verse five, Paul says, so out of that, Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Now, 
that text has always caused me pause. So I thought I'd pause there for a moment. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Now this is this is up. If you go back up to verse three, there Paul says, "Since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me," so they were demanding some sort of proof. Uh, remember, Paul admitted that he wasn't as good a speaker as some of the super apostles. So uh, they want proof. And you know, I thought to myself, I wonder if they're demanding some supernatural proof. That would be human nature, right? Do a miracle and prove it to us that you are who you say you are. So Paul's kicking back now in this verse five, and he says, if you're in the faith and you examine yourself and you test to see if you're in the faith, if you find that you are, then I don't have anything to prove. You'll know what I'm talking about, about weakness. And remember, they're having a very hard time understanding this thing about God working in weakness. God doesn't work in weakness. He works only in the powerful stuff I do, <laughs> right? And uh, so Paul is saying, once again, the proof is in the power of God in the weakness. So now I ask yourself, though, I thought that was interesting. Paul's actually asking them, right? He's ra it raises an important question here. He's asking them to ask themselves, am I really a Christian? He wants that. They know what he said. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Um, and then, and once again, he's, he's asking them to ask that question, but he's also saying, if you find yourself in the faith, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, um, you know, I, I thought it, it's a sobering thought that someone could think. Paul's raising this question. Sobering thought that someone could think they were a Christian and they really weren't. Over the years, I've gotten asked that question. Hey, do you think somebody could think they really are and they aren't? I, it, it, it's so tough for some people. I hate to even mention it. Um, matter of fact, it's one of the many reasons why people ask me, well, how come if God's in the church, does bad stuff happen in the church? And I'll say, well, first of all, not everybody goes to church is a Christian or follower of God. So, and just because they're in church, people, they, you know, something happened. But then there's also those of us who think that we're, um, that we're Christians, who, who we have some sort of head understanding, um, but we're really not either living the Christian life or we haven't truly um, made that decision um, to, to follow Christ. Um, and so the, that's one of the reasons why we see bad stuff uh, in the church. And then we're, we're all human, right? And, uh, but there are people who think they're Christians and they really aren't. And, and uh, I think in this, like you might be saying, well, how do I know if I'm not? Remember, Paul keeps taking the people back to the basic gospel. And that's one of the things I thought. One thing, you got to go back to the basic gospel. And what I mean, maybe you've heard of the four spiritual laws, the Romans road, acknowledging your sin. I'll get to that in a second. But I think what you have to understand is um, receiving Jesus Christ, knowing the, base, ba the basic gospel and, and accepting it and praying that prayer of, of repentance is more than just informative academic understanding or more than the informative academic sense. Maybe you've heard it, uh, I've said it before. You can know of Jesus, and that doesn't mean that you know Jesus. To know of him doesn't mean that we know him. So what I say is that conversion experience has to be, it has to be informative, academic. I got to have a head knowledge of it and know it, and make that decision. But it has to be transformative. There has to be transformation in my life chain. Now, not everybody realizes that instantly or whatever else, but in that walk with Christ. So, so here's what I say. Here's what the basic gospel with transformation. Have you acknowledged Jesus is God's son? Have you acknowledged your sin? Have you asked for forgiveness? And has it changed your life? Um, so, and, and what I... What I mean is, is in that initial recognizing that I need Jesus, repentance comes. And repentance is a key word here. Matter of fact, Matthew 4, 17 says, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. So what is repent? Repent is doing a 180, a, tr a change in the life. So has it been, is it head knowledge, but has it been transformational? Now, some of you, maybe you're like Cindy, my wife, who 
accepted Jesus when she was very, very young. So there wasn't like this terrible life she had to change. But she could testify to you that she understands that if she wouldn't have, where'd she be today without Jesus? So in her life too, it's transformative. So hopefully it makes sense to you. So we want to get past just the knowing of Jesus and into, and I think Paul's saying that to these people, you know of Jesus, but the way you're talking and acting and the way you gauge things of your own personal success in the church and everything else is of the world. It's, it's not, for some reason, you're not experiencing the, the transformation at all. Um, they were living by the standards of, of the world. So I think Paul, one of the things Paul's saying there too, is just a final thought I had there. One of the things Paul's saying is, are you, remember the super apostles, right? And Paul's kind of leaning into that because he's just finished up that whole thing about that. And are you depending on yourself or on Jesus? What is important to you? Your stuff or Jesus stuff? Am I constantly making myself important or do I find myself wanting to make Christ important? And so there were just thoughts along that, him asking them, <laughs> test yourselves. And we should all, right? Okay, verse six and seven. Let's see if we can do this here. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong, not so that people will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. And I, I got stopped on that verse seven. I thought that that's really interesting, verse seven there, where he says, uh, you, will, you will not uh, do anything wrong that they're, um, uh, let's see, let me find my place real quick. Yeah, in uh, verse seven, now we pray that God, uh, to God, that you will not do anything wrong, not so uh, that people will see you, uh, will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right. And Paul, I mean, one thing's obvious, that he's trying to let them know that the greatest concern is for them, right? So I thought, in other words, Paul's saying, we want what's best for you, no matter what it means for us. Isn't that what Paul's saying? So I found this, uh, a paraphrase, contemporary English version, that I thought clears it up a little bit. It's kind of helpful. We pray you will stop doing evil things. And of course, he's leaning into the stuff he's confronted them on. We don't pray like this to make ourselves look good, but to get you to do right, even if we are failures. And I think he's leaning into, remember, um, he, he was saying, I know when I explain this stuff about weakness and power to you, that it's going to sound foolish. And he's leaning into that again and going, well, okay, we may seem like failures, but um, our concern is for you. Um, now, in uh, let's see here, in verse 9, let's pick it up at verse 9. We are glad whenever we are weak but you are strong. There's that comparison again. And our prayer is that you may be fully restored. And, uh, and they were really, you know, like I said, we don't, for decades, it appears like, and according to Clement, who knew the church, um, they, had, they had been restored and done very well for a lengthy, fairly lengthy period of time. Okay, so now I want to jump down to um, verse 11. In verse 10, he says, uh, this is why I write these things. Um, uh, remember, we referred to that earlier where he's responding. Um, uh, I write these things when I'm absent, that when I, can, I come, I may not have to be harsh to that criticism that he's harsh in his letters, but not in person. And then in verse 11, uh, 11, in the short and sweet final greeting, finally. Brothers, or brothers and sisters, King James Version, brethren, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. We don't do that in church, right? I've threatened people. We should figure out what that is. And people that don't like handshaking, right? which now with COVID, we haven't done much of. People return to a little bit. Verse 13, all God's people here send their greetings. 
May the grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Short and sweet. Verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Seems a little, after all the harsh and the severe, Paul says, rejoice. You know, after all that tough stuff. So it's interesting to me, because I went to translations. Is this what they all say? It was interesting what's in the King James Version. I mentioned the King James Version to you, which was uh, authorized in 1611. So some of the language is different for us. But uh, the King James Version actually uses the word um, farewell. It, it says, finally, brethren, farewell right? So it kind of begged the question, why in the world would it say farewell? Well, when you get to this in the Greek, here's our Greek studies and word help studies. Um, first of all, if you look at the definition, to rejoice, to be glad, usage, rejoice and glad as a salutation or to hail someone like the king or whatever. Um, properly down here in the helps, to delight in God's grace Rejoice, literally to experience God's grace, be conscious, glad for his grace. So what I found out, first of all, several, a couple, at least two, use this farewell because it was rejoice or be joyful, which I like, but it was often a, a goodbye, so they translated it farewell. I don't personally think that's the best translation. Finally, brethren, farewell. If I signed off to you tonight using Paul, Paul's words, I wouldn't say that, right? But it helps us to under that understand. Two paraphrases, I think there were paraphrases, use the word goodbye instead of farewell. Finally, brothers, farewell. Or finally, brothers, goodbye. Finally, brothers and sisters, goodbye. Um, but I'll tell you what, rejoice, I think, is the best translation. Um, and you can see that here. It's one of the reasons why it's listed as first. But And then when you look at this, to delight in God's grace, to rejoice, to literally experience God's grace. Um, I really like, there were two translations, I think, and it says, be joyful. Finally, brothers and sisters, be joyful. Now, back to the question, was Paul being insincere after all the harsh stuff? Um, I don't think so at all. Um, I think Paul in some ways remembered he told them to test themselves. Now he's just finishing up with the joy test. <laughs> he wants them to pass the joy test. I read one commentary that explained it. Listen to what it says here. Even though Paul has been severe with the Corinthian, uh, Corinthian Christians, all was written to the end that they would enjoy the joy of walking in a right relationship with God. So I don't think he was insincere at all. It was his goal. It was his longing. It was his love for the Corinthians. All of his writings was that they would enjoy, rejoice, and experience the life of joy that comes from being in right relationship with God. So you know what I thought application for you and me? We all have bad days. Grouchy, well, maybe not all of us, most of us. Crouchy days. But is it joy for you to walk in right relationship with God? In my decades of walking with the Lord, I've found, even though that there's tough days, that it's a joy to be in right relationship with God. So the question for us tonight as we leave, do you know the joy of walking in right relationship with God? If you never entered into a relationship with Christ, you don't know what that means. I, you can back up, rewind, and I gave a quick explanation. You'll have to search for it there, but it's there. You can go to our website. In that same area of links, you'll find a great explanation about what it means. Or maybe you're a believer and a follower of Christ, and you're realizing that you've been living out a more head knowledge of Jesus, and it hasn't been so much out of relationship with Jesus, because that's where it needs to come from. And I suggest you pray and ask God for, you know, for help living in the relationship. But this reminded me of an old song talking about the 
joy. I want to finish with that. It's a song called, It is Joy Unspeakable. I'm going to be tempted not to sing it to you because I love to sing it, but you definitely do, do not want me to do that. So let me just read some of the words about the joy we find in Christ. I have found his grace is all complete. He supplieth every need. While I sit and learn at Jesus' feet, I am free, yes, free indeed. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, the half has never yet been told. I have found the pleasure I once craved. It is joy and peace within. What a wondrous blessing. I am saved from the awful gulf of sin. I have found that hope so bright and clear, living in the realm of grace. Oh, the Savior's presence is so near. I can see his smiling face. I have found the joy no tongue can tell, how its waves of glory roll. It is like a great or flowing well springing up within my soul. It is joy unspeakable and full of glory. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the joy of our relationship with you. Father, we have moments and days and times when we don't feel happy. Maybe we're under stress and pressure or difficulty. But Father, may all of us kind of do a self-examination like the Apostle Paul said, look at our lives, Father. And maybe even the joy test to see if our relationship with you is one that's, that's, um, that's filled with the joy of a right relationship with you. If not, Father, we come up wanting there, then give us clarity as to whether we need to pray as believers that, um, that the relationship is more significant to us than just head knowledge. Maybe we'll realize this evening that we haven't prayed that prayer of repentance and we'll do it. But Father, thank you for your love and your mercy that leads us to joy and to feeling full of your glory and grace. Be with each and every home in person tonight, in your strength, your power, in your peace that passes all understanding. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what I'm going to say. Have a God week.